Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord as we celebrate this Lenten Sunday today, especially with a tribute to St. Patrick. We're very excited to have you with us. Have many visitors here today and so excited and our regular folks as well as those online joining from other states. Uh, we're just excited to have everybody with us this morning. You'll notice in your bulletin, it is the opportunity to order your Easter lilies. Uh, so there's an envelope there for you, and you might want to do it in memory or in honor of someone. And then we also have our Lenten schedule, wonderful opportunities. You'll note especially Holy Week with our Palm Sunday and then Monday, Thursday with the Supper, and then uh, Good Friday and Easter all the wonderful things that we'll be doing together. We're also excited to announce to you that our anniversary this year is 120 years, and we're going to celebrate. November 12th, the bishop is coming, Bishop Tom Berlin, and former pastors. We've already talked to several who are able to come back and join with us. So November 12th, we'll put it out there uh, and get the information to you as soon as possible. But if you know folks who have moved away and they want to come back and join us or any kind of celebration, uh, Mark Caldwell was the first one to say, yes, sir, I'm there. <laughs> so a lot of folks, you know, uh, joined when Mark was here as well. So we're excited to have him. Let us stand for our, join for our opening hymn, Be, Be Thou My Vision. Let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
before you're seated, if you'll turn around and wave to your neighbor and just see who's with us this morning. Wonderful to have each and every one of you with us. Thank you. This morning, our scriptures come to us first from John's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Hear now the word of God. As he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with his saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means scent. So the man went and washed and came home, seeing his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, Oh no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. And he told to me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed. And then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know. And then from Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything expressed by, exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why he said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. me and died, source of my salvation, yet was crucified. Peace that knows no measure, this by faith I see, love that knows no died for me. Lord, oh Lord, we renew our commitment these forty nights and days. And Lord, oh Lord, by your grace, help us change our sin. 
Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you. May my words become your message for each of us, your people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue our Lenten journey, we mentioned that the book of John has both symbolism and story. And our invitation during Lent is to get to know Jesus better, get to know ourselves better, and today, get to see how Jesus teaches us about our Heavenly Father. We were introduced to this story about Jesus healing a blind man. Jesus is healing him with mud and saliva. I remember as a child thinking, yuck, right? But what he's showing us is that God has already provided the things we need for healing at our fingertips. Wow. This healing involves Jesus restoring sight. So what is John's symbolism? For us, who is blind in this story? All of us. The disciples are blind because they say, if someone is blind, they must have sinned. Or maybe their parents sinned. As if any struggle or difficulty in life is a reason that we did it, we caused it or someone we care about caused it to us. And Jesus say, no, God doesn't operate that way. Did you know that our image of God shapes our lives? How we see God, if God is the advocate or the adversary, if God is the healer or the punisher, the idea that God would make an infant blind from birth to punish his parents, Jesus will have no part of that. No, that is not who our God is. How we see God informs how we treat one another. If they truly believed that anyone who was suffering or struggled was struggling because of sin, perhaps they would not reach out. How many people remember the Samaritan story when the priest and the Levite walk right on by? Perhaps you're in the ditch because of something you did or didn't do. How we see God informs how we see ourselves, our suffering, our struggles. Do we see it as God's finger crushing us? Jesus said, this is not who God is. God is not the source of disease and suffering, but God rather is the healer who takes every opportunity to display his work of deliverance and help. How do you see God? I remember I was with someone who had cancer, and he began to say, you know, what is God trying to teach me? And I said, well, what if you look at God as the healer, not the harmer? What is God going to do through you to show the world? If God is the source of your hope and not the source of your despair, 
what is your message to the world? John's gospel showed us Nicodemus, afraid to be seen with Jesus, the woman at the well who was not condemned but rather released to share the good news with her whole village. Now we see this blind man, and the blindness will be healed, and even the begging will stop. He will see the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God, and he will see who God is. When Robert Louis Stevenson, the famous author, was a young boy, he was intrigued by the work of the town's lamplighter, who went about with a ladder and a torch, setting the street lights aglow for the evening. We don't have that anymore. But imagine a person going around from lampstand to lampstand, putting a torch of light in the night. One night, as he watched the man from his window, he exclaimed to his parents, Look, look, there's a man out there punching holes in the darkness. Look. With that one statement, he summed up the work and life of our Lord Jesus Christ. A teacher, a preacher, a healer, a miracle worker, whose primary purpose is to punch gaping holes in the darkness that shrouds our world. A world that God had created so splendidly and miraculously and lovingly. We too are invited by Jesus to be the light of the world. Imagine those who gathered around wanting to question the man. Instead of celebrating the healing There were some who were religious sticklers of the day. They wanted to point out blindness as a punishment for sin and Sabbath as a day that no one should be healed or working. Catch the rule breaker is more important than witnessing to the love of God. Catch the person doing the wrong thing instead of seeing God in your midst. Even today, there are some who would practice the religion of shaming and blaming rather than celebrating the presence and power of God. This man was born blind. He lived his entire life to that day in darkness, in poverty, until he encountered Jesus. John's gospel is telling us that we are living in darkness and we are impoverished until we open our eyes in the love of Jesus Christ. God is the healer. God is the source of light and love, not the source of darkness and condemnation. John 3.16 had only occurred in six chapters earlier. He came not to condemn us. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should have eternal life. John also wants us to notice that not everyone is thrilled with Jesus This divine revelation sent by God challenges the dark systems, the dark systems of reward and retribution, law and blame, shame and containment, abuse of power and coercion. Jesus is ripping that darkness. He's punching gaping holes bringing out light. When this man was healed, he had to go to the synagogue. He wanted to celebrate this good news. And the Pharisees were there, and they asked him all the questions, who did this, and why did he do it on this day? And it was all about rule-breaking. 
when he answered all their questions and talked about Jesus, they said, well, where is this man? Not because they wanted to celebrate. They wanted to hunt him down. And he says, I don't know. They push him out of the synagogue. Their religion had become more important to them than actually experiencing the presence of God and God's power to change lives. Sometimes those who think they have a corner on the truth are actually suffocating others from the real presence of Christ. They wouldn't even recognize Jesus if he showed up today and walked down the center aisle of any church because he would still challenge the way we see God. He would challenge the way we practice our faith if we have withheld love from our neighbor. It was the reason Jesus was killed. Do you remember Jesus' first sermon? It was in his hometown of Nazareth. And they loved it when they realized Joseph's son speaks so eloquently with authority. This is exciting. One of our own guys, one of our kids that grew up here. How exciting. Until he got to the part. Not only are we here to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, but we're also here to show you that God has healed people in other lands like Syria. God has healed healed Naaman, the Syrian. They were so pissed and angry, they were ready to throw him off a cliff. Somehow God was here not just for the Jews, but for everyone? No way. Our favored position is being threatened by this young upstart. They're ready to throw him off the cliff. And what does he do? He stands up. And he walks with confidence the other direction. That was his first sermon in his hometown. What would Jesus say to us today? Both our text in John and Ephesians show us that Jesus is the shining light. We're all invited into his presence. Jesus reveals who God really is the hope giver, the chain breaker, the deliverer, the helper, the healer. God is shaking us out of our numbness and slumber into his goodness and marvelous light. In March, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day, the life and witness of one of God's faith heroes. Now, Patrick lived in Britain possibly in Wales or Scotland, in 390 A.D. We kind of like that, the Scottish folk in the room. You know, I have Welsh blood and Scottish blood. It's like Patrick started over there, and then he delivered the Irish people. (laughs) Says he was a young son of a Roman senator. Did you know that? I mean, he had a birthright, all right. His father was a Roman senator and tax collector. He was stolen by Irish pirates. Now, perhaps you might wonder, I wonder, if it was a type of protest. The Irish pirates were tired of Britain's strong arm. Take one of their boys, the senator's son, make him a slave. See how he likes that. So at 16, he was taken. He was a slave for six years. They had him serving as a shepherd. And he actually identified with King David in some of his meditations. For six years, he was a shepherd boy without any voice, without any power. This noble born was a shepherd boy. The image of the shepherd and God's deliverance led him to become a priest. He changed his name. He was born Mywin Sucket. He became Patricios. It means 
born noble. Early in his 20s, he had a vision. He heard a voice crying out to him, Return to Ireland. We appeal to you, holy servant boy. Come and walk among us. 390 A.D. We appeal to you. Come and walk among us. Imagine going back to the place where people had put you into slavery. And imagine that God is asking you to go back there and deliver his people. Now, we have another story to share. He went back, but he used the symbols that they were familiar with to convert them. Imagine that someone's coming into your village and you're used to using Celtic knots. You're used to even worshiping trees. And this man says, well, that's a beautiful knot. Maybe it looks like the roots of the oak tree. And maybe the tree is like the scripture tells us, the tree of life. Let's look at it that way. The circle that the Druids used to worship the sun and immortality, he places it over the cross, and you have the Celtic cross. And he says, you worshipped the S-U-N. Now let's worship the S-O-N, immortality. Do you know how many missionaries have gone into villages and shaken people up and say, you pagans, you backward people, and never honored anything that was indigenous. It happened many times. Remember a story uh, in the movie called Mission, where there's a good priest, and then there's some that are not so good. They're trying to take over and turn these people into slaves, and the people begin to say, you know, if this is who God is, why are we converting to Christianity? Do you see the difference that Patrick had? He used the images they were familiar with and showed them how scripture tied right in. There's a beautiful church in Savannah, Georgia called St. John's Cathedral and the famous Dora Knot that looks, you'll, you've seen it many times, the Dora Knot from the Celtic tradition is in the base of their baptismal font. There are Irish, many Irish, who gathered and came over to Ireland, I mean over from Ireland to Savannah. And they have talked about this when they baptize babies. That image is the tree of life. That image is immortality, eternity. One of Patrick's famous prayers includes the breastplate we'll read towards the end of the service. But there's another, may the strength of God pilot us, may the wisdom of God instruct us, may the hand of God protect us, may the word of God direct us. He also used the three-leafed shamrock to teach about the Trinity, three in one. Now, during the month of March, we also recognize someone else who heard God, like Patrick did, to liberate her people, to go back to the place where she was a slave. Her name is Harriet Tubman. She was a Methodist. She struggled with the reality that the Methodist pastor that she was growing up with often preached whatever the master wanted to hear, like, slaves obey your masters. But he was the key link to the Underground Railroad. He was saying one thing, and he was doing another. She was raised a slave in Maryland. She sensed God's nearness from a young age, a call to help deliver others from slavery to freedom. 
She is quoted as saying, God's voice guided me and steered me to where I am needed. Once she escaped, she realized she needed to get the others. She's considered the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. That's a person who goes back and delivers people. There were abolitionists who did it. They had a different color skin. Not as much risk to them. She got 70 people out of slavery into freedom. And then she led a Union brigade as a scout into an area where 750 were liberated. They nicknamed her Moses. Her chant, let my people go. Many could not believe it was a woman, let alone a former slave. Patrick was a man, but a former slave, both hearing the call of God. She lived to the age of 91, and she told many who would listen, God showed me the future, and my people are free. Her faith informed her at every turn. When she was challenged, even by former slave owners, she said, I've heard I can have liberty or death. If I can't have one, I'll have the other. Later in life, she also worked for the women's right to vote. Now, these are two faith heroes from very different times in history, different cultures. But it reminds us that God has a hand in history in every generation. And it's always the hand pointing towards light, life, healing, hope, never darkness, suffering, despair. Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of my favorite texts. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future of hope. This is who our God is. The authentic message never contradicts the revelation we have in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our song of reflection is Amazing Grace.
may be seated. I'm not sure if, if any of you or many of you have heard the story about Amazing Grace. Um, not only was it written by a former slave trader who became a Christian, changed his ways, but he said the melody and even some of the words, um, the melody came from the slave ships. He heard them singing this tune and he didn't even know what the words were, but he changed it into a song for us to sing. Let us go to God now in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful for all the witnesses throughout history that point us to you. We give you thanks and praise this day for Patrick and Harriet, who listened for your voice, who heard you clearly. Come, walk among us. Help your people. Free us from our bondage to sin and decay and despair. O oh Lord, speak to us today in the quiet of your Holy Spirit's prompting, enabling us to be your witnesses in our time, in this place, in this community. Help us to be those poking punching out spaces in the dark to make room for your light. Wherever we see things that are dark, overbearing, manipulative, controlling, let us shed light. Let us be instruments of your light, your love, and your peace. Oh Lord, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As part of our benediction, we'll use the St. Patrick prayer, and I think Matt has it up there. Okay. Let us say this together. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, 
Christ in me, Christ over me, Christ to the right of me, Christ to the left of me, Christ in lying down, Christ in sitting, Christ in rising up, Christ in the heart of every person who may think of me, Christ in the mouth of every person who may speak of me, Christ in every eye which may look on me, Christ in every ear which may hear me. Let us receive the blessing that God would bless us with his presence and power, that we would receive the forgiveness of our sin and walk in his grace and light, that we might be the light in this world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.